Well, um, for many, many years now, um, I've been ticking off the ever-increasing sources of radiation to which human, humans are subjected. And they are so numerous and being added to all the time. It was very clear to me that there is an agenda here of subjecting humanity to more and more radiation. Uh, it's a long story and many, many elements to why, but the fact that they're doing it is becoming obvious. And so when um, the explosions at Fukushima happened in Japan, um, from my perspective, having, having looked at this over a number of years, it was just too much of a gift to this cabal, given the scale, the stunning scale of radiation that not only was released immediately, but has gone on being released ever since. Um, and, you know, there's reports recently um, uh, out of Europe of, of, of finding this these high levels of radiation, and it's like, where is it coming from? Well, there's a very good chance of where it's coming from, because Fukushima has been pouring this stuff out incessantly, um, day after day after day. So, I um, started looking into, into it, and the, one of the first things I noticed, and other people started looking at this as well, was that the uh, explosion that was captured on video of one of the uh, reactors exploding in Fukushima, and a, the explosion, the, the, the smoke stack of a small nuclear device, were uh, extraordinarily similar. So um, I then started looking um, at anything that could have explained this, and I came across the fact that in the years leading up to Fukushima, um, those reactors and that site in general had installed a new um, surveillance camera and sensor system uh, with with these uh, this technology put into the reactors and, and other parts of the site. And when you look at it, you know today that um, technology is is getting ever lighter, it's getting ever smaller. And yet, um, when you looked at these uh, cameras and sensors that were uh, installed into Fukushima in, this, in the months before this happened, um, they were like ludicrous. You remember, you remember, you know, you get these little, little tiny kind of mobile phones now. And yet, when mobile phones started, they're about that blooming I big, just as old as you hear with two ends, you know. Well, it, that was the kind of difference between the kind of surveillance technology you see normally now and these things. They, they weighed a thousand pounds. And then, when you put one of those next to a, what they call a gun-type nuclear weapon, which is a small nuclear device, if you take the casing off the gun-type nuclear weapon, what is inside is, shall we say, not a million miles from what these um, cameras and sensors look like. And it was, you know, with other information, it was my view, I concluded, that these were small nuclear devices and that Fukushima was blown up on purpose to release that radiation as part of this much wider radiation agenda to irradiate the atmosphere of the planet much more than it has been up to this point. Um, and then I, I, I asked, of course, I asked the question, um, who put these devices in, these sensors in? And it turns out to be an Israeli company located at Dimona in Israel. And Dimona is the location of the massive Israeli nuclear weapons program. And I can tell you from 22 years of research, there is no such thing as an Israeli security company that is not a front for Mossad. It's not allowed. And, and then um, there was a man called Arnie Gunderson, who was a nuclear engineer, and he uh, made a speech uh, in Boston, and it was almost like an alert. It was like, hey, we found something about Fukushima which, which should not have happened, and this has great implications for uh, uh, you know, containment design and, uh, and, and uh, nuclear design.
And what he'd found from the, the footage is that the explosions at Fukushima were, moved so fast that they passed the, the speed of sound and entered the realm of what is known as a detonation wave. And as he pointed out, a nuclear explosion uh, at a nuclear plant like that should never, ever become a detonation wave. It, 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 it produces what, what, what they call a deflagration wave, which is below the speed of sound. And his, his um, alert was, hey, we had no idea this was possible. He says, I've talked to a bunch of chemists and we can't work out how it is possible for a nuclear explosion at a plant like that to cause a detonation wave. Well, maybe it wasn't a nuclear explosion of that kind that caused the detonation wave, but a device designed to detonate. And it is my strong view that Fukushima was blown up on purpose um, uh, to release this stunning level of radiation. And then, of course, the question comes, well, well uh, okay, so you're saying that they put these things in and blew it up, and then they just sit around strumming their fingers, hoping that some kind of earthquake and tsunami comes along as cover for it. Well, no, which is when we come to um, what you just mentioned, harp. And Harp um, relates to a man very well known in this area of the world, Nikolai Tesla. Nikolai Tesla was the scientific genius of the 20th century, and if he was alive today, he'd be the scientific genius probably of the first part of the 21st century. Um, he had understood many things about the nature of our reality. He'd understood about the, the electrical, electromagnetic fields uh, that, that you can access and turn into usable warmth and power, which the uh, cabal uh, that, that owns the energy industry of the world has been suppressing because it doesn't want people to have access to this free energy, which we could have. And by the way, the same people who are saying we must lower carbon emissions because of global warming, which is another I mean, nonsense, this human caused global warming lie, they're the same people that are suppressing the development of use of free energy technology, which, which Tesla developed and understood, um, which could eliminate the carbon uh, power systems, you know, immediately. So it, it, it's all a lie. But Okay, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories today, but I did want to give you a sample. That's a recording from David Icke on a YouTube video. And I just want to give the full spectrum of possibility when it comes to Fukushima. Was it organic or was it contrived? That's a good question. We need to examine all possibilities. Everything is on the table. And like a lot of these incidents, there's a whole bunch that doesn't add up. There's a whole bunch that doesn't add up. And, and if you want to look into that, Google a term uh, called Project SEAL. And Project SEAL is a tsunami bomb. Okay, and this is old tech from the 50s and look into that. Okay, we're going to jump right into uh, to, uh, the Freedom of Information for your documents. And before it's all said and done today, I'm going to talk about some fatality, fatality study. And I'll also briefly uh, speak to Sandy Hook because there's a whole lot of damage control starting to happen even in mainstream media. So we need to have a look at that and address that. Okay, and let me back up because I've gone. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Excuse me, I want to start on, and there's a link to this, to Uncovering Plumegate. You can join right in on Capture Title Number 23, Cell Phone, No FOIA, No Freedom of Information Act. This is one we touched briefly upon yesterday where there, <clears throat> there seems to be evidence of this all throughout the FOIA documents where they, they know they're being recorded and sometimes they say, you know, call me later on a different line or we need to take this offline for this conversation. So here's one of a similar nature. Jim Wiggins. But we certainly needed a point of contact to start talking about things and some heavy redaction. Yeah, this is redaction, redaction. Jim Wiggins, okay. Redaction on this case looks like someone's name. We don't get to see who the name is. And let me give you my cell phone, too, because that's how kind of our operating right now. Jim Wiggins, yeah. 
Redaction. It's redacted. Jim Wiggins. Okay, great. Redacted over the name again. Hey, Jim, is Bill Borchardt in today because I'd like to talk with him? Jim Wiggins, yes, I can give you his inside line. You might still catch him. So there may be a number of possibilities where there's there's back lines and other lines where they can communicate on, and certainly just meeting someone in person without a cell phone and without recorders present is probably the best way, and maybe there's a whole lot of that going on. Next screen capture, Jim Wiggins. He called in at 8 o'clock for a status, Bill Borchart. okay, Jim Wiggins. And that was the last we heard. Bill Borchart. okay, well, I'll keep trying. I'll send him an email. I'll CC you on your personal email. I mean, your work, but under your name. Jim Wiggins. Yeah, my name. That's what I'm, that's what I'm monitoring. Bill Borchardt. Okay. Jim Wiggins. All right. But I'll just tell you, we're filing every email for, you know, potential later for you. Freedom of Information Act. Bill Borchardt. Yes, yes. Jim Wiggins. You know that. Bill Borchardt. Yep, absolutely. Jim Wiggins. All right. Bye. Again, very, um, consistent um, indications that they they're all very aware of the Freedom of Information Act which briefly I might add it's under attack there was a uh, my wife worked for a place here at the University the Miriam Breckner Freedom of Information Center I believe it was called with long uh, title and there's still it's still operating in it to a limited extent but when the economy crashed well the the lady that uh, had all the funds that were produced to keep this freedom of information, it's kind of school, it was cranking out. Students were going there to learn how to go teach others to use Freedom of Information Act. Is excellent. Bill Chamberlain was the uh, professor that was teaching at the time. But it downsized. Now it's just one guy. It's a, it's a strange story, too. I ought to tell it one time. But the upshot of it all is it's not what it used to be. It's, not, it's like they cut it back. They downsized it. <clears throat> It's not turning out the number of students they used to so aggressively that go out and pursue teaching others how to use the Freedom of Information Act. So it's bad enough that they're aware of the Freedom of Information, and some conversations are taken offline. There's a lot of redaction, but also in a larger extent, if you look around, I guarantee it's not just the University of Florida. I bet it's everywhere that there's a Freedom of Information program. If there are any others, I'm not familiar with them, but... I'm sure they're under attack all over the place. This is one of the things they'd like to see just go away and disappear. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next screen capture. This is about seawater. They talk about this quite a bit in the for your document spraying the uh, damaged plants with seawater. That's, that's how bad the situation is there. Make no mistake, at the point you have to bring a concrete truck in and start shipping billions of dollar pumps from Australia, you are not prepared to handle an uh, uh, emergency of this extent. This is very clear in the documents. Chairman Jaxco, what I'd like to try and do, hopefully you got the messages, is just kind of remind me what our priorities were since the last turnover, what our priorities are going to be going forward, and then any updates. We don't have to do them in that order. If you want to start with the updates, that would be fine. Brian Sharon. Okay, Chairman, this is Brian Sharon. The top priorities are units Continue the steps with radiological conditions, dose projections, and the protection action recommendation. Obviously, we're trying to provide technical assistance to the U.S. ambassador in Japan. We've been working closely with Chuck Castro and his team in terms of the request that they've had from us, you know, to try to provide them with some information as well as just some, you know, brainstorming some ideas. You know, for example, last night, the Japanese were concerned about continued seawater circulation through the reactors because that basically turns the reactors into a big desalinization plant. Okay, I'm going to stop right there, and, and, and there's a, been a, quite a bit of discussion in the documents about what happens when you blast these things with seawater. Does it cake up with salt? What kind of reactions are going on in there? A lot of this has never before happened. No one's really, this is new territory that they're treading, so it's all just a study and kind of see what happens. Besides the fact, then you have this, contaminated seawater that has biological material in it. When you go to seal stuff back up and run pumps and circulate water, I read where there's a big concern that when you do that, you can get green algae and strange stuff growing in there. So the fluid they use to cool these reactors, you have to keep in mind, it's kind of like, a, um, think of it as like a distilled water would be what we would equate it to that you would use for your antifreeze or you know something to that effect, a very high quality fluid there is no salt there's no biological material in it it's just you know it's perfect and it has to be that way once you introduce these foreign substances well folks it's just not that easy you can't just flush it out where does all this salt water go that they're spraying all over the place 
And here later they mention their worry about turning the ground to mush because they're spraying so many ton, ton so much tonnage of water, literally an incredible tonnage of water. And and then there is the ground going to turn to mush? You know, that was a concern too. Now why is this relevant? Because over here we have Mark I containments, we have Mark II containments in the United States. We have a lot of old power plants that have been relicensed. That is a big concern. Well, it, what's happened over there is a great example to look at and say, hey, how do they respond to that? And, and they can say, well, it's in Japan. It's a long ways away. That's why it wasn't. No, I, I don't buy that. Japan's a technologically advanced country. They've been nuclear power for many years, and they have all this industry to go in there and try to help them. And you can see it's just a complete mess. And there's no easy solution at all. In fact, there's been no permanent solution yet. They are still emanating radiation to some extent from these from the faci Daiichi facility. So back to the screen capture. <clears throat> so, you know, for example, last night the Japanese were concerned about continued seawater circulation through the reactors because that basically turns the reactors into a big desalinization plant. The water boils off but leaves a residual salt. And the concern was that if they, if they do that for too long, you get a big salt buildup, which could either affect heat transfer in the core through to the fuel or even perhaps start to partially plug, partially plug of panels. Chairman Jacks go, mm-hmm, Brian Sh Sharon. And so the concern the Japanese had was how can we get fresh water in? And they were concerned that they couldn't access the reactor because of the high dose rates. And so they asked us if we had any ideas on how they might reduce those dose rates in order to get closer and maybe try to access the primary system to get some fresh water supplies. Although we still don't know if they even have any fresh water supplies that are available should they get access. I've asked the question of Chuck to find out because they're injecting seawater into the reactor. And the real question is, where are they getting the seawater from? Obviously from the sea. But how is it getting into the reactor? They must have some sort of a path that they were able to make. And the question is, is that path available so that they could hook up a freshwater supply? Chairman Jacks go, okay. Brian Sharon, but that's still an ongoing issue. So also this is indicative of just how bad it is. If there's there's a hole, they punch a hole in the side and they're they're blasting seawater in there to cool it down. I mean that is I don't think you can get much more serious than that, folks. Okay, next screen capture. Number twenty eight, unit four, spent fuel pool is what my notation is on this one. Chairman Jacksco. Okay, maybe you can just walk me through the status of the plant and issues. Anything you want me through there. Brian Sharon, sure. Units one, two, and three appear to be in stable condition with seawater injection continuing. The containments are believed to be intact in units one, two, and three. Containment pressure in unit three is believed to have stabilized and venting is not expected. TEPCO believes that the water they've sprayed on the unit three spent fuel pool has had some effect on reducing the dose rates. So they went from 3.4 millisieverts to 2.75 millisieverts 500 meters north of the reactor. And even if you don't know about sieverts and what have you, just look at the numbers, 3.4 to 2.75. TEPCO, again, I don't know how reliable the source. They're not in, in initially reliable at all, but they're trying to show that they're, the spraying that they're doing is, is lowering the dose rates. Is this true or not? I cannot tell you. But I can tell you this. TEPCO it has a long, long record of being absolutely dishonest and less than forthright with the public. So you really initially, again, what, what's the whole thing about Plume Gate? It's a giant cover-up. What are the Japanese going to do? Cover everything up. It's no different. All these governments are the same around the world. So don't kid yourself and think that Japan, Japanese government may be honorable, you know, because you've watched some samurai movies. It's probably not like that, <laughs> okay? Okay, continuing on, he says, and their focus right now is on the Unit 4 spent fuel pool. Chairman Jasko, okay. Brian Sharon. So the Japanese Self-Defense Forces, their fire department, plans to resume water injection to the Unit 4 spent fuel pool from the ground level today. Chairman Jasko, okay. Brian Sharon, they've got two diesel generators running and supplying AC power to Units 5 and 6. Unit 5 residual heat removal pump, which is powered by one of the Unit 6 diesel generators, was started and is providing cooling to the Unit 5 spent fuel pool. Chairman Jacksco, okay, good. Brian Sharon, TEPCO's right now installing high-voltage cables near the transmission line to Units 1 and 2. Priority is being given to restoring power to the RHR and cooling water pumps. 
Chairman Jasko. Okay, do you have do they have an estimate of when is the earliest that could be done? Okay, right here I thought it was interesting to look and, and see this. These are from the uh, 19th, if I'm not mistaken, the date, March 19th. And so clearly at this point there's still no power. Units 1 and 2, he says, TEPCO's right now installing high-voltage cables near the transmission line to Units 1 and 2. So they're still trying to get power for sure to 1 and 2, don't have any power. How long have they been without power? March 11th was the initial incident. So do the math and look in there and, and, and think about these things, how long this has been going on. Five and six also thought it was interesting to note weren't nearly as damaged. And if you want to get to the conspiracy theory realm, isn't it a coincidence that <clears throat> Unit 3, which had the MOX fuel, and Unit 4 that had the massive amount of bundles offloaded into the spent fuel or the, the pool above the facility, above the Taurus as well, you know, it's interesting, those two were hardest hit, especially the number three with the MOX fuel. And there's plenty of indications in here of plumes and stuff coming out of these things, as we'll cover. And this one document right here, for me, was really as big as the one previously we examined with the children's thy thyroid doses to California. This one even has probably more uh, uh, bigger, uh, more uh, incredible uh, knock-your-socks-off stuff in it. And the President's Run is another one. We're actually referring to the President and some of this stuff here. <clears throat> Okay, so continuing along, Brian Sharon says, says units 1 and 2 have temporary power to 6.9 kilovolt panel, and TEPCO is working to have temporary cables run to necessary equipment. Again, you're getting a good picture. At, you know, we've got a lot of plants on the coast, folks. We really do. And so when a giant wave of salt water washes up there high enough to go over and inundate all these electrical panels, I've been very clear on this and very clearly in the documents early on, they tell you what a mess it is because the circuitry, the electrical boards and the grids and the panels and everything is washed up with salt water. It shorts out and then it's just totally ruined. You, you can't use any of it. It's, all of it is absolutely destroyed. You, could, you, know, you, you might be able to strip wire down and recoat a wire or something. That's, going out, that's out of the, you know, over and above the call of duty. So all of this stuff is in a condition where you can't easily have to begin to roll new wires in, get uh, power back to it, reestablish another circuit board, replace the sensitive equipment that was damaged. If the water goes high enough, who's to say even in the control room you can activate? There, there's discussion in here, are the electronics even still good? Once we get power to it, is anything going to power up? How much has been flooded with water? You've been spraying it with hoses with tons and tons of seawater. Okay, so this is, if you think it's going to be any different when it happens over here, it's probably not. It's going to follow right along what happened here. There'll be a big cover-up. They won't be honest, just like with Fort Calhoun and the flooding that came real close to causing an incident there. There's a blackout on that. You had to find a French uh, website to find pictures of Fort Calhoun. That's the best I could come up with. That's how tight the blackout was. Okay, Chairman, Chairman Jacksco. Okay, Brian Sharon. Chairman Jacksco agrees a lot. He just says okay a lot, doesn't he? Brian Sharon, power to units three and four is planned for later, perhaps by Monday. And that's really about all we know right now in terms of where they are with the electrical hookup. So by the following Monday, they're saying they'll have power to units three and four. That does not mean that the control rooms are up and operating, all the equipment's good. That simply means there's a hot line in there, and they can hook into that and then begin to use that to power, you know, they could power tools and stuff to begin to make repairs and affect repairs, okay? But you at least have a source of power, but no, it's not the entire power grid and wires and boxes and everything are not replaced magically and become brand new. It just doesn't work that way. Unfortunately not. Might I remind you, solar cell technology, if they would release and stop suppressing patents, we could have more than 20% efficient solar panels. If they quit spraying the chemtrail planes all the time and quit the global dimming, well, you could probably, we could all power, and if you, again, if you had a government program to help everyone get these solar panels, it's a matter of national security, and in my mind, it's an, an absolute matter of national You can, well, you can either settle for a very dangerous a uh, 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 position with these nuclear plants that if, if you take the route David Icke talks about, we're worried there's a rogue element that are, can use these to blackmail countries. They trick you into having a nuclear power plant say, hey, it's a great monopoly, your people can't reproduce it, you make a lot of money, GE will sell you the plant. Then later on, what do they do? 
Well, any number of ways you can, if we look at the Stuxnet virus they used on Iran, there's any number of ways to cause a plant, a, c a catastrophe to plant. So then it becomes an instrument of blackmail, and that's another extreme worry of mine because, well, I, I've got actual evidence on my YouTube channel. If you type in Fort Calhoun, I've got a video from 2011 where I, I documented harp signatures. They were chemtrailing, and then the storm went right for Fort Calhoun, and that was that followed six weeks of heavy rains, heavy chemtrailing, heavy rains, heavy Heavy. I don't know if it's harp or satellites or what they're using, but these signatures abound during these uh, controlled weather events. So it's very worrisome for many of us. I don't think David Icke is far off at all. You know, you can put the shape shift and reptilians to the side and look at everything else he says, and, and for sure, you know, I, I, I'm in much in agreement with a lot of what he says. And the shape shift and reptilians, hey, you can't prove nor disprove. So, okay, let's continue right along. I don't want to get distracted with shape-shifting reptilians, although it's a very interesting subject, no doubt. He says, we're still awaiting results from NARIC. This is Brian Sharon. We'll st we're still awaiting results from NARIC. They do the plume modeling on the bounding worst case source terms potential effects on the U.S. Great little uh, uh, sentence, uh, a statement from Brian Sharon right there. We're still awaiting results from NARIC, the plume modeling on the bounding worst case source terms potential effects on the U.S. There's plenty of references in this document right here to worst case scenario effects on the U.S. and the president, president this, president that. Okay, this was, again, why are these documents held until after Obama's election? Hmm, think about it. Why was Alex Jones and alternative media and mainstream media and all these other plenty, plenty of sites not go into these documents? Well, as I said before, I was clear. I, I told people Obama was going to win the election. I put my whole reputation. I said, if he doesn't win, I'll shut up and go away. I'll go back to doing music. I'll do recording. I won't do another uh, activist video or article or broadcast or anything. Well, I knew he was going to win just based on the amount of energy and effort that went into covering him on just the kind of stuff I'm reading about now. It's not quite as damning as this document here, but it's pretty close, the children's thyroid doses and, and plenty of other stuff in the, you know, that we've already covered. Okay, so terms potential effects on the U.S. They know all about the possibility, and, and when they discuss Three Mile and Chernobyl, you know, you can only come to the conclusion that a lot of these guys, unless you just got to work for the NRC and, and you're green and you have no clue somehow, they know exactly what happens in a meltdown. And this one was much more serious than Chernobyl, much more serious than Three Mile, and you've got the Pacific jet stream running from Japan to the United States. So those factors alone, for your documents aside, folks, they know everything. They know everything. And they, they, they knew we were going to get hit. For your documents aside, that you can't convince me they didn't know. You cannot convince But then the documents is the icing on the cake where we can read these guys talking about, you know, worst case scenarios, U.S., California, Hawaii. Then they even talk about Obama's speech. We're going to get into that. If I can shut up, we'll get into that and, and read from that as well. It's, it's super interesting. Okay, so they're uh, focusing on this worst case. They say Jaxco says, okay, Brian Sharon, the protective measures team here has drafted a more realistic worst case source term that is still being evaluated and is focusing efforts on this scenario. The wind direction right now is primarily from the south for the next 12 hours, and then it's expected to shift to the southeast, which would be again offshore. Chairman Jaxco, okay, do we have an update on the Bechtel equipment from Australia? Brian Sharon, I don't. I apologize. I was not given any new information. Okay, that, I think this next clip is in regards to stability off-site power. Okay, Chairman Jasko, he says, okay, good. Larry Camper, so it sounds like the progress is taking place there. Chairman Jasko, good, good. Yeah, and I think on that, the continued thing to emphasize is some sense of urgency with that, actions that. You know, the situation seems to be stabilizing, but it's not yet what I will call long-term stability. And that, in my mind, is essentially off-site power restored and at least some degree of more normal circulation in for the reactors and then stable water level in the pools. That Okay, again, out of all these characters, I like Jaxco. And, he, and that's probably why he's down the road right now. They had to get rid of the guy because if you don't just totally uh, lose your spine and let your spine turn to jelly... They need to get you down the road. You're not in full cooperation. And Jaxco initially did the 50-mile evacuation that I'm sure they were none too pleased about because that, my understanding is the previous 
furthest was 10 miles. They would say 10 miles is all you got to go. Well, it was bad enough. They must have had some information to say, hey, make it 50 miles. Don't take any chances. And, and that later panned out to be true. That throughout the documents, they say, yeah, that was right. That was the right call. But that was a red flag to everybody else to say, hey, this is pretty darn serious, serious enough to go to 50 miles. And so then all of a sudden, people who were genuinely concerned and, and others that are posers like Associated Press, they began to file for freedom of information. Of course, you won't hear some of this stuff on, you'll never hear it on Associated Press ever, ever. Kajasko says, good, good. Yeah, I think on that the continued emphasis is some sense of urgency with that, actions that. You know, the situation seems to be stabilizing. This makes total sense. But long-term stability, he's saying, is off-site power restored and, you, and you're having circulation in the reactors again to some extent. Stable water levels and pools. Right now there's a lot of discussion. Number four is dry. There's no water in it. We're not even seeing a mist coming out of it. Brian Sharon. Yes, sir. What we don't know right now, and I think Chuck Castro has expressed concern, and that is that even though they've gotten off-site power back onto the site and are in the process of hooking it up, we really don't know whether this equipment is going to, is going to run once it's hooked up. Chairman Jaxco, yeah, yeah. Well, are we thinking ahead? If that were to happen about, you know, alternate pumps and other, other ways we can bring in portable pumps that you could, Brian Sharon. Well, that's what's coming in from Australia. Chairman Jaxco, okay, okay, good. So that would deal with all that. Brian Sharon, yes. Chairman Jaxco, okay, good. Brian Sharon, but the problem, one of the problems was trying to find places to hook up to. Chairman Jaxco, yeah, got it. So pumps are not an easy solution. We can see that. Okay, number 33, Tokyo Rads. Chairman Jaxco, yeah, got it. Okay, other updates, the status you have for me. Brian Sharon, just updates. We've asked Jack Foster over in Tokyo on our site team to find out what he knows, what the Japanese know about increased radiation levels that they're seeing in food products. Chairman Jacksco, okay. Brian Sharon, and we're looking right now at redaction, 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 redaction. Chairman Jacksco, okay, good. Whatever that was, they don't want you to see. It was damn serious. There's heavy depositions in the direction of Tokyo. And I tell you now, when you look at the evidence, a lot of people got dosed. Even reporters that were foolish enough to even think of flying to Japan to report, I would have never done it. I would have never done it. Very foolish. Chairman Jasko, okay, good. Brian Sharon. And I think that is about it unless you have any questions. Jasko, no, that sounds good. And then in terms of notifications to me, have a low threshold for my engagement if we get hung up in any interagency issues or kind of this work with the INPO, that's the International Nuclear Plant Operators um, Organization, the INPO team, if there's any slowdowns or anything like that. Okay, now this, this next series is about Unit 4. John Moniger. Okay, are you ready? Brian Sharon, yes. Brian, John Moniger. So we agree that Unit 4 is definitely a priority also. Several days ago, our number one priority with Unit 3, again, that's the one with the MOX fuel, Unit 3, and then they were going to move to Unit 4. They had done some rough calc several days ago showing that Unit 3 was empty, and everything we have seen out here, we generally agree with their assessment that Unit 3 should be the priority. We did not perform, pardon me, Brian Sharon, the spent fuel pool or the primary containment, he's asking a question. The spent fuel pool or containment, John Moniger, the spent fuel pool. Brian Sharon, okay, and you can see right here in this little clip, calc several days ago showing that Unit 3 was empty. A lot of this shows exactly what, you know, what they knew at that time. There's no water in the spent fuel pool. And number four, they're very clear they don't believe what TEPCO is saying, and they don't believe these thermal scans later in some of these clips. We'll talk about the TEPCOs alleging to have done thermal scams, scans, but they're maybe thermal scams because in the end they don't, they don't believe what they're telling them. John Moniger. Okay, so that was back on 3, looks like 318. It was TEPCO who had performed a calculation with regard to six days being left. But they said those calculations have large uncertainty in them. They have no clear indications, you know, what the level is in the buildings. They've been trying aerial photography and all kinds of stuff, but, you know, they really don't know. They've also been doing the infrared detection, and they say, you know, all pools show at or less than 100 degrees Celsius. But, you know, with the amount of rubble and stuff on top, it's, it's very difficult to, to be able to rely on any of those indications. Brian Sharon, 
Well, the, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, John Moniger. We out here, we have been concerned about spent fuel pool reactor four for a very long time also. You know, the stuff they're doing, you know, initially the fire trucks and now, then they had this, the riot spray pumps. And then yesterday, or, you know, probably about 36 hours ago, they brought in that airport super high capacity remote unmanned pumper truck. Brian Sharon, yep. John Moniger. And also the, the helicopters, all those systems are really not highly effective or actually just marginally effective. And, you know, the problem is, I mean, we're shooting from so far away, you have incredible losses. Brian Sharon, right. He's meaning, oh, he, he, he kind of goes into it. But he's meaning the further you have to spray that uh, length of water, the jet of water, the more drops off and falls off and you lose by the time what actually is landing on it, what actually is dripping down, what's going inside, what actually is cooling out of that hole, what percentage is actually being effective. John Moniger. I mean, just with that powdering, the dropout, et cetera. So that's, so that's all that. So yes, we've been concerned with Unit 4 all along. And I think Unit 4 is the one we got in a little bit of trouble with, with, you know, the assessments of structural integrity to the side of the spent fuel pool wall. I think that's the one that has the damage further down on the sides. So we had some questions from right on asking whether one entire wall of the spent fuel pool had been taken out. They later came back with some drawings and some photos showing their our concern with the wall. Yes, that was a major exterior concrete wall, but the spent fuel wall was a different wall that was further in, but okay. Dave Skeen, S-K-E-E-N. Hey, John, this is Dave Skeen. I'm sorry. I just caught the last part of your conversation there. I, I thought it was three we were concerned about, the wall and the spent fuel pool, because that was the one that had the largest explosion and looked like it blew out of, blew out of a pretty big piece of concrete wall. John Moniger, yes. Dave Skeen, the concern with four was always it should have about ten times the decay heat in there of three, because they had to have full core offload in there. Um, Jim Moniger, right. Dave Skeen, yet when we see pictures, we never see any steam coming out of four, which would lead you to believe that there's no steam. There must not be any water to steam out of there. John Moniger, right. Dave Skeen, and so it seems like it must be dry. John Moniger, right. Brian Sharon, John, what we're looking what right now is, you know, the, the fellow from Naval Reactors made a recommendation that we should get the rest of those pumps and associated equipment that's in Australia on airplanes and over to, to the site. The question is, I have no idea, you know, you know, it's a nice, they, they know, they say it's a wonderful thing to do, but I have no idea. John Moniger. Some of this transcription may be poor. It might not make a lot of sense. It's kind of broken in some places. Clearly back there, let me back up before I go to the next screen capture. You, know, you can see the severity of the situation between three and four. Again, three with the MOX fuel and number four with his incredible num number of bundles offloaded. And there's discussion later about did they position those bundles evenly in the pool because if they put them all on one side, it would be the heat would be have more in that area. And so once you lose cooling capacity, you may have more chance to go to a Zerk fire or some kind of melt much quicker. And so that's a concern in here they talk about. But these last ones here and the ones we're going to look at are very indicative as to the actual state of three and four and that one and two are bad, no power there, but they're the efforts are concentrated on these other two. So I, I tell you now, probably the worst has already happened, and so much has been released now. It's an incredible amount. Okay, there's some redaction there, but then it goes on to say, so you know, I, I'm giving you the context. So you know, if you try to discuss the spray systems, two, three, and four, you know, right now one, one train, it is incredibly unclear what will happen with this one system when it lands in our country. The train he's referring to is the Bechtel pumping system, one unit of that pumping system, one train. It's incredibly unclear what will happen with this one system when it lands in the country. Brian Sharon. All right. So I guess I'm gathering from this that you don't need any more pumps right now. John Moniger, right. Brian Sharon, but the concern, I guess, that was expressed over here, and I don't know if you guys looked at it independently, is if the is it the spent fuel pool in number four is dry, right? John Moniger says, right? 
Brian Sharon, and you know, apparently has a full core offload on there. Okay, it's dry and has a full core offload on there. You know, is this is it a molten mass that's starting to head into, you know, starting to interact into the concrete? John Moniger, right. We are we actually think the steaming is good and we've raised the concerns, you know, multiple times uh, when the steaming when the steaming stopping. You know, they're they're at a loss what to do. They're at a loss what to do, he says a second time. You know, the helicopter overflights, you know, it's reported out and you go to the meetings and they say, you know, so many, not hundreds, but so many tens of tons of water have been dropped, you know, or hundreds of tons of water have been dropped. And then you look at TV and you're like, well, that cannot be like less than 10% effective due to the speed of the helicopter, the winds, etc. And they acknowledge and you're, you know, so the one thing is being reported in the media that these fire trucks are going in and out. The helicopters are doing this, the supercapacity pumping system. But then when you get actually down onto TEPCO, into TEPCO and start talking to the engineers, you find out that it really isn't that effective. So we, you know, in terms of, you know, that pool, well, I should stop right here while I'm thinking about it. Well, what this is showing you right here, if you look at what these guys are talking, they know how serious it is. They know how serious it is. They know. They know right there. All these people, they knew. And no one gave us any kind of warnings over here when Taiwan got them, France got them, UK, places farther away like the United Kingdom and France got rainwater warnings, green leafy vegetable warnings, that kind of thing. So this is incredible, absolutely. This, this document right this one right here, and when we get to the back of this document, we might not get to it today, but this week we will. They start talking about these Navy ships, and there's information here that needs to probably come up in that a lawsuit that's going on right now. And this is reliable information because it's documented in the form of the FOIA information here. And it's, you know, it's something that is excellent to use at a trial when you can say, hey, they knew this. They gave coordinates somewhere. They're talking about heavy doses and what to do with the Navy and the ships. You know, interesting, though. Okay, let me continue along. So we, you know, in terms of, you know, that pool or even Unit 3, I mean, Unit 3 was, you know, they believe Unit 3 was, you know, they believed Unit 3 was dry. And they just come out and say it. Again, they all know they're re being recorded for you, but sometimes they just have to spit it out. They believed Unit 3 was dry, he says. And it was multiple days before, you know, they got those, even those first fire trucks in. So that's why they put their priority on Unit 3. And they believe that they had some time on Unit 4. They had moved some, some equipment over to Unit 4. I just, you know, so they are working both Unit 3 and Unit 4. But, you know, we've pushed on very significantly to, to you know, what is your assessment? Why do you believe what we're doing is effective given this huge spray range? And that's John Moniger speaking there. I want to make sure I go back and make that clear on that little uh, section. And he ends up saying, what do you believe that, that what you're doing is effective given this huge spray range? And they come back and say, well, and there's some redaction in this section. And he says, and inaudible. A lot of times inaudible is used when I, I, you know, I'd like to hear the tape myself. I don't have time to go through them, so don't send me links to tapes and stuff. And inaudible, I said, well, if that's the case, why are you relying upon it? They say, you know, if anything was hotter, uh, redaction, redaction, redaction. I said it was our understanding throughout discussions with you guys that the Unit 1 roof did not explode outwards and all the debris go all over the place, but essentially dropped down on, on the slab onto the pool and the refueling floor. Okay, that I thought was pretty hardcore right there. What, essentially what he's saying is a Unit 1 roof did not explode outwards. It fell back in. It dropped down on, on the slab onto the pool and the refueling floor. And a lot of places here, a couple places, they say even if you're pumping it with a jet of water, essentially the roof is collapsed and it's covering it. It's not a direct, it's not directly hitting what you, it's not like a house is on fire and you pull up in your fire truck and of course you, you hit the fire dead on, right? It's not the same here. We have stuff falling back down on it, containment, you know, it's, mm, it's nuclear power, what can I say? Beautiful, isn't it? Okay, back to the document. I said if that's the case, redaction, redaction, more or less, for all four sites, how can you say that? You know, one, because the roof, you know, is three inches or so of concrete. You know, you're not comparing apples to apples. You know, if you had a clear view of the spent fuel pool through the water, that would be fine. But one of them, you may have an entire concrete roof sitting on top. Others, you have varying amounts of debris. And, you know, there's really no response. 
you know, then, then they're telling us all these volume of water that have been put in. And folks, I might add the Mark I containment. We have similar designs of designs that are almost identical over here in the States. Concrete roof over it? Yes. Spent fuel pool above the reactor? Yes. That's the sheer brilliance of nuclear power. And we don't have time for a learning curve for them to learn after, well, after the 10th meltdown, we'll have figured it out. And we don't have that time. We don't have it. We don't have time for another Fukushima meltdown. And if you look at Robert Alvarez's study in the spent fuel pool situation in America, crisis level, crisis level. I said, hey, all right, that's fine. But I've seen it on TV. I saw the helicopters on TV. I said, had you done any back of, they want to say, we put 100 tons of water on because that's what, what has been pumped. I said, have you done any back of the envelope calculations? What would it take to fill that thing and throw in your losses for spraying and throw in some type of estimated losses for what may potentially be getting through this debris? No response. You know, then the other thing is, all right, so your fire trucks are going in, your trucks are going out, your fire trucks are going in, your fire trucks are going out, you're telling us the number of truck runs, these tons of water that have gone in there, do the fire trucks have rad monitors on them? You should be seeing, when you get closer to the reactor building, incredible shine from the spent fuel pool. Have the rad monitors changed from truck to truck to truck that would, that would show some level of shielding from the pool being filled? You know, some level that you could assess that what you're doing is doing some good? The answer is no. We have not been looking or no, they said. First, they looked back and forth, and, and the one guy said, no, there's been no change. So, so I said, you know, at this meeting here, you've told us that you've been effective and successful in these helicopter runs, in the fire truck runs, etc. And the measure, measures you're using is this redacted, something's redacted their thing. You know, some of the units are still nothing coming down, you know, redacted, redacted, redacted. You know, the ones that you're doing RAD monitoring for, there's no change due to the potential shielding and the water coming off. So, you know, so Brian Sharon, okay, well, I think you answered my question. John Moniger, yeah, yeah. So that that's a lot of insight into Unit 4, Unit 3, the spent fuel pool situation, dry, what can I say, days and days and days, no power, you know. The brain stuff on it, how effective was it? Everyone's saying not very effective. It's really just a PR show to keep the Japanese people calm because they had had this, is, you know, for Japan, we'll see in 10 to 15 years what that country looks like, won't we? Some of us will still be around, hopefully. It's not going to be pretty. Okay, the next screen captures about these concrete pump trucks. John Moniker, yeah, yeah. Well, with that, and so Jennifer, well, the reactor safety team and Bechtel, etc., they're running through all these issues. And the biggest issue for the pumping for the Bechtel slash NRC system, if it comes on site, there's a good chance they won't use it. But even if they did use it, they don't think it will be effective. So now what we're doing is we're looking at that concrete pumper truck that they have two of them in Japan, and they are saying they're getting them to the site, the concrete pumping truck. You know, the notion is to get the boom and the hose, you know, 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, you know, whatever, right on top of the reactor building, right over the top of the spent fuel pool, and the water's just going to drop straight down. It's not a spray pattern or anything. Brian Sharon writes, so you can see that they're, what they've been doing up to this time is largely ineffective. The bell pumps, they, everyone has their doubts. Are we even going to be able to hook them up? Will they, will they work right? Will they pump water? Is the water going to get in there? Can we bring concrete pumping? They're coming up with anything. They really don't have, there is no cure all fix all, man. And we got these all over, not just in the States, but again, as I say, this is a, a weapon of blackmail when you think about it. Any country with foolish enough to build a nuclear power plant is now subject to a terrorist attack on that plant. And this was clearly stated by General William S. Cohen in 1997 at a, some kind of committee meeting or whatever. He was asked, he went on to elaborate about eco-terrorism, where even now people are using electromagnetic magnetic waves to set off volcanoes and earthquakes remotely. Back in 1997, our own General William S. Cohen, many of you are familiar with that and have heard this before. Some of you may have not. But you can Google that and look into that. It's an absolute fact. This is a big worry of mine. These things are extremely dangerous. It's very hard for a terrorist to hold you hostage over a solar panel, right? He can say, I'm going to blow up your solar panels. Go ahead, fool. Go ahead. I'm going to have you arrested, right? But a nuclear power plant, you know, 
And then there's this craziness, if you've seen the e and &E News article about the machine gunners they are going to have to position at the nuclear That's how bad it is, folks. I'm not even going to go into my Godzilla King Kong theory right now. We'll do that on another day. Okay, next screen capture. Again, about the Bechtel and the concrete pumps. John Moniger. So one, one of the things that you guys back there are doing, Bechtel and company, is looking at, hey, how can we use 90% of this system that is coming up from Australia and hook it into the concrete pumping truck? I mean, there's, you know, probably 6-inch or 8-inch pipe there. You've got the boom for the concrete pumping truck, and then you've got the steel piping that actually carries the concrete. You know, what can be done to put the T in there, you know, some type of connect into the concrete pumping truck? You know, one of our things, potential concerns with the concrete pumping truck, which is the TEPCO system, is the notion that, you know, is that really a system that is rated for continuous 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of your operations. We want it, and that's one, one of the design concepts or philosophy things, was for the Bechtel system. So the, the, the con concrete truck, he's saying, you know, it's not, is it designed to go for a whole year if it had to? You know, maybe the Bechtel pumps are, but that's, again, it's not an easy fix, as, as we'll see throughout these documents. It says, put together a commercial industrial system. These pumps that are designed for continuous operation versus the concrete pumping truck, so, and versus the need for an operator or whatever to have to get right up close there, you know, for refueling operations, et cetera. So, you know, what's what our system with the rocket cannon, the guys put a huge diesel storage tank on the back of a flatbed trailer. So so we agree, you know, that Unit 4, you know, there's no idea what's going on with Unit 4. There's no, we don't have any clear idea that Unit 3 has gotten any better. And, you know, we've gotten a little bit of trouble out here, you know, passing on or just even discussing assessments, you know. And, you know, if you guys want to talk what you're talking about before, you know, the spent fuel pool, you know, going through the floor, which is in my mind, too, and I've mentioned it to several people, what's that going to do? Right now, the RAD levels at that site are high as hell, okay? You know, several of us have talked about if that happens, are the RAD levels at the site somehow going to skyrocket? Okay, now they're talking about the spent fuel falling through the floor, and what's beneath that? The torus. That's the big circular thing inside the, uh, the it's part of the nuclear reactor. Again, I'm not an expert on all this either. I'm going to have to brush back up on them. I've got some diagrams and some documents to look at these Mark I containments and, and study them. Okay, again, the next screen capture about pumps and rims. Uh, he's continuing from before. Let me back up. He says, okay, you know, if that happens, are the rad levels at the site somehow going to skyrocket? Skyrocket, I mean, there are already 10 to 30 rims per hour in areas. If it goes through the spent fuel pool floor... What is that going to do to access to your site to continue to do anything for Unit 1 spent fuel pool, Unit 2 spent fuel pool, Unit 4 spent fuel pool, or the three reactors? So that's 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 a concern. You understand that. Dave Skeen, yeah, we got you, John. We'll take a look at that. Okay, and this next one is about seawater again. A big concern when you're going to use seawater. Fresh water would be better, but either way... You're, what kind of mess do you have with the radioactive water seeping into the ground, spraying all over the place? You know what? I I got to give the guys credit that go in there to to do damage control. Uh, wow. They just got a lot of balls. I don't know how else to say it because I'm a coward, and I probably wouldn't go in and do it knowing that what my eventual fate would likely be. I guess it just had to melt down, and I'd head in the other direction as far as I could go. Okay, John Moniger. Right, right. So Chuck has had two meetings with the CEO, the CNO of TEPCO. Yesterday, he, the CEO, the CNO, told Chuck the two areas that are most concerned to him, where he really needs the most help with, is this issue of salt accumulation in the reactor and help determining what the hell they should do with the, with the radiation fields on site. So that went to Chuck, Brian Sharon. John? John Moniger. Yo, Brian Sharon. One of the questions I've been asking, and I think everybody's scratching their head, and that is that they found a way to pump seawater into the reactors, right? John Moniger, yep, yep. Brian Sharon, well, where are they, where is that hookup from? Where is, where is the function, where is the function coming from? And can they access it to get to, to put, if they had freshwater supplies, could they access the suction point and hook up a freshwater supply? 
John Moniger. Yeah, and that's that's what we said, you know, just it's being sucked from the from the ocean. And they never said whether there were stationary diesel pumps down there or if it's a daisy chain of fire trucks, whatever. But yeah, it's you just switch the suction. You just pull the hose from that damn source to this tanker over here, you know. So we it's it's you know, it seems so obvious what the solution is. You know, and not only that, you know, the thoughts among the team is, you know, so you've had this evaporating for all these days. Well, once you have the fresh water, you don't want to continue this, the boiling in there, if there's a current concern with salt. Do you want to consider upping the game on the pump and start flushing out the system to start depleting the salt out of the primary system? And after you've done that for so many hours or whatever, you throttle it back to what? You know, steaming for decay heat. Brian Sharon, right. Dave Skeen, right. John Moniger. But but with that, you know, they told Chuck that his number one issue, we need help on these two issues. Very shortly after that, went to a meeting with the Ministry of Defense. They wanted a status report on our efforts and recommendations for those two topics. They wanted our assessment for those two topics. We're like, you did guys just inform us that these are two concerns you have, you know, so that was yesterday. Then Chuck met, there's a problem with the days back and forth there. But then Chuck... I don't know if these are sequential pages. Let me make sure here. This may skip another page, but again, this is related to seawater. Screen captured, titled 52 Seawater. Probably about 18 hours later, 12 hours later, met with the CEO and the CNO, and he said, we are in need of significant dire help on these two issues. I think this is a direct continuation, yes. So Chuck is, five seconds before Chuck strolling in, the lead engineer or my interface from TEPCO has me on the phone. How quickly can I come down here to discuss these two issues? And Chuck's like, you've got to get down there. We've got to be working on these issues. You know, if the CNO is pushing, they have to know something. If their CNO is pushing us, actually asking us for help, they have to know something. It has to be more severe for them to really be inaudible. So I'm arranging these meetings with these guys. I call back to Jennifer. I get Jennifer to get, you know, so this is Sunday night, midnight, Saturday night, midnight for you guys. Sunday night, midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., Dave Skeen, right? And this is kind of amusing because later they talk about the time change. It's like you're either awake or, in, you know, over here, you're asleep over there. If you sleep over there, you're awake over here. So it doesn't mesh with the American time and the Japanese time. And, and I do have some feeling for the, what these people had to go through to their hours and, the, you know, how they must have conditioned, they must have physically been in as far as being, you're working at these oddball times and having to wake up whenever the phone rings because, you know, you have to answer it if the if it's important, as any of these are. Okay, John Moniger. I get Jennifer to get all these guys from GE, Exelon, INPO, the International um, Nuclear Plant Operators, et cetera, on the phone for this discussion on salt. What the hell should we do with it? We get in the meeting and got all Jennifer's team on the web, and what do they want to do? They want to talk about the pumping truck. That's when we get the 20 questions on the pumping system, you know? And then there's a huge block of redaction right there. Just the rest of that page is redacted. Into the next page, Brian Sharon, all right. Dave Skeen, all right. So, John, you say you're going to try to set up another call to talk about salt. Maybe tonight on the midnight shift again. John Moniger, I have told, these guys, told those guys we are ready. We will meet with them whenever you want, anytime you want. I said we would get the people back in Washington on the phone because we can always pull the reactor safety team in. Whether we can get the expanded team with INPO and all that kind of stuff, you know, who knows. But I said any time of day, we will come down to your building. We will meet any place you want. You know, I'll let you know. Dave Skeen, okay. John Moniger. I mean, yeah, the other thing is we go down to the meetings now. We have to take that taxi cab into the basement garage. There's huge protesters, cameras, cops surrounding the TEPCO facility. Parentheses, off mic conversation. <laughs> I thought it was interesting on this one, the protesters, they're describing what's going on outside the TEPCO facility. <laughs> that people aren't happy. There's, and when it happens here, when this big one happens here, it's going to be the same reaction here, and people are going to get an incredible lesson, just like most of the Japanese did when this thing. They got a big dose of reality. So that's where we are um, John Moniger says, we agree with your concerns with the unit four spent fuel pool, but right now our equipment, there's too many uncertainties to, to say go forward with the other three trains. Dave Skeen, okay, well, 
we'll go take a look at the how can we use the Bechtel system to tie into a concrete pumper truck. I really don't think that's going to be a big concern because we were tied into a fire, a rocket launcher anyway, John Moniger. So, yeah, and they're like, how do you do that? How do you do that? I say, you put a freaking T in the system. It's a pipe. It's no big deal. <laughs> I said to them, this, this system is nothing. This is basic hardware. This is basic piping. There's nothing commercial grade here. It's just industrial piping. This guy is a engineer, a practical engineer, and, and that's what he's saying. Well, I don't understand what the problem is. You put a T pipe in there, and then it, you know, it splits the, uh, splits the direction of the water. Dave Skeen, have you seen a copy of the Bechtel system? I mean, they, they made a little engineering drawing of the whole system tied together. Did they send that to you, John Moniger? There, so there was, I think that was maybe, I've seen three different renditions. That was the original uh, Joe Williams cartoon of it. Okay, this is the schematics and the drawings of the Bechtel pump. That's the best they got. Again, this industry is just totally discombobulated, unorganized, hasn't a clue what's going on. Do you really think they're going to respond over here when it happens in a professional a manner as if they've well rehearsed and practiced with all the equipment, everything in place, backup systems, tertiary systems, everything's ready to go, men trained on a constant basis, ready for multiple uh, different problems at the same time of an unknown nature. We have a whole other team to uh, uh, deal with unknown, unforeseen. No, they don't. They don't have it. It's not like that. I guarantee it. It's just not. Dave Skeen, yeah, John Munger. Then there, yeah, then there was one, there was actually a, a spec sheet, you know, Dave Skeen, right, inaudible, drawing, yeah, John Moniker, yeah, yeah, the engineering drawing, yeah, we had that out, we have shared that with them, etc. but they, when they came to us, you know, today in the meeting with, with TEPCO, they said they're talking, you know, this boom truck, boom truck, 58 meters, well, we, we, what happened is they, you know, they were like, can we shoot up 50 meters versus 58? I said, well, yeah, it's no big deal. I said, well, we'll check into it. But the design specs for the water cannons were 50 meters high, and I think 100 meters out with 500 gallon per minute. I said, you know, if you're not telling us the 58, we think we'll be able to throttle the nozzle down to reach the 58 meters. We'll have Bechtel and all run it down. But you may not get 500 gallons per minute in there. But we said... We threw a margin in there anyway, so we said we didn't think it was an issue. But the whole issue with the 50 versus 58 wasn't for the fire rockets to reach that high. It was what they said they believed we were bringing that they said they believed was on this flight from Australia, these super concrete pumper agitator pumps. They said, no, that was your system. There was That was one of the options in the Bechtel drawing. But all of our discussions with you have been on the fire rocket system. They said, well, no, we had believed you were bringing the concrete pumping truck. I said, you already told us you guys have two of them in Japan. <laughs> so you can see a little bit of, uh, you know, again, wow, discombobulation, lack of communication, and it doesn't like anything they bring in isn't going to be an easy fix anyway. Okay, I'm going to read a couple more of these and sum it up, and now real quick discussion of Sandy Hook, and I've got some recording to do on my new song, so I'm anxious to get back to that. Okay, this next one, 58, is titled DOE Summarizing Reports to Washington. John Moniger, yeah, the meetings we go, yeah, the meetings we go to, you know, a lot of them, we're, well, the ones we go to, we're the lead with the NRC, but you've got a huge contingent of people from the Department of Defense going with us, Air Force, Navy, you know, DOE guys are following us around, you know, whatever. It's, it's actually pretty good to have us all in the same room there. So, and the DOE guys, they're filling detailed reports, you know, summarizing all the interactions and shipping it back to, you know, to their people in Washington. Dave Skeen, all right. Well, I'll let you get back to whatever you're doing there, John. John Moniger, all right, I'm getting ready to jump in the shower. Brian Sharon, okay. Okay, and that's probably a good one to stop on here and and. We're going to get into some interesting stuff about meetings on the Hill, uh, the presence, this, the presence, that. It really begins to pick up, and, and it becomes very serious, too. In the end, we'll examine this back and forth, what I believe to be a discussion of a hot spot, and they give coordinates, and they talk about the Navy ships, and what are we going to do about that. And if you read through, through there's some redaction, but you kind of get a feel that you know, this is part of the issue these sailors are suing about right now. You know, it's not like the Navy ships just were sent there or moved into the area. We have multiple uh, bases, Okinawa and others, since World War II. We've owned Japan. We've never left. They've wanted us out of there for some time. 
And we have ships there, uh, air uh, strips. We have bases there, a very heavy uh, U.S. presence in Japan. So at the time of the meltdowns, part of the concern, and you can hear them talking about it, is in regards to positioning of boats and ships of our military, of the Navy, and also positions of bases and troops that might be affected. And you can clearly see in the uh, documents plumes headed towards uh, uh, Tokyo. And, and so the evidence is there in the documents that the whole place got blasted. There's depositions inland. There's plumes floating out to sea. Uh, we have ships that may be in the area of some heavy deposition, and they even give coordinates. I'll have to... Uh, Google this and type in these coordinates and see if I can give you an exact spot. And that's where we'll pick up with tomorrow and Friday. And, you know, if things go well every day next week, although as I say, I'm recording right now and I want to try to get something done on a couple of these tunes. Okay, so if you're recording for Plumegate and the NRC for your documents, this is where you want to turn your recorder off. And we'll come back to this tomorrow.